so um, I hope I'm sharing my screen. Yes, you are. Good. OK, so um, I want to explore over the next half an hour the point of mathematical puzzles. Why did somebody create a particular mathematical puzzle? I'm going to look at some examples, but it might seem really obvious. You know, what is a puzzle for? Is it for entertainment to entertain people who are trying to solve it? Some people enjoy that. Is it about learning how to solve a real world problem? If not directly, then at least developing skills which will help people address real world problems in due course. Logical thinking analysis. Is it so? Is it training in logical thinking? Is it about developing desirable qualities like perseverance, resilience, confidence, the ability to overcome setbacks, to try something else when the first idea doesn't work, to, to develop the confidence to believe you can solve unfamiliar problems? And I said the related question, can you appreciate a, a puzzle without attempting to solve it for yourself? Or do you have to make a serious attempt to solve a puzzle before you can get full benefit from it. OK, so I want to begin with a puzzle from the first mathematics book written in English um, or printed in English. An introduction for to learn to reckon with the pen or with the counters, etc, etc. Not before seen in our English tongue. First published 1536, an anonymous publication and it contains a section of essentially mathematical puzzles, many of which are still familiar to us in similar guises. But here is one that I think is particularly noteworthy. Um, there's a cat at the foot of a tree of height 300 feet. This cat goes upward each day 17 feet and descends 12 feet each night. How long does she take to reach the top? So we see immediately, like, like all good mathematical problems, this is a practical real life situation. Um, if you have a cat, I've no doubt you've often watched her climbing the 300 foot trees in your garden and run, wondered how long she will take to reach the top. And the book tells you not only the answer, but how to do it. Take the night from the day, that is 12 from 17, leaving five. So the cat gains each day five feet. Divide now 300 by five. And so after 60 days, she shall be at the top. And thus, you may do all similar problems. So this is great. We have a method for a solution and it can apply not just to this problem, but to lots of other problems. Just what you want, except that the answer actually is wrong. If we think about it, after 57 days, the cat has gained five feet 57 times, has risen to a height of 285 feet. On the 58th day, she climbs another 17 feet and reaches the top of the tree. So she gets to the top before the 60th day, actually on the 58th day. And for me, this is the whole point of this puzzle. The point is that the simple answer is wrong. You have to think a bit more carefully. If you like, there's a catch in it. And really, without the catch, the puzzle isn't, I think, of very much interest. So the author of this book seems to me to have missed the point here. Um, what has happened? Um, a friend of mine has suggested that he's probably copied the puzzle from an existing French or Dutch book, and he hasn't read to the end of the solution. He perhaps didn't turn the page or just stopped at what he thought was the end and has missed the whole point of the puzzle. This is actually quite a sloppy book. Um, the British Library paid £95,000 for a copy a few years ago, I think there are better puzzle books available now more cheaply than that. But I want to mention one other puzzle from this book. Um, it's a version of a problem known as the Josephus problem, which goes back to antiquity. Um, in this setting, there are 30 merchants on a ship which is sinking. 15 of the merchants are on our side, 15 are the enemy. The ship is sinking, weight has to be lost. They decide to sacrifice 15 of the merchants in order to save the ship. But which 15? So they stand in a circle and it's agreed that every ninth merchant will be cast overboard until there's only 15 left. So the question is, where should we position the 30 merchants so that the 15 on our side are all safe and the 15 enemies are all 
thrown overboard. So the book gives the answer, and here it is. We should arrange them so there are four of our men, five of them, two of ours, one of them, three of ours, one of them, and so on. And if you have trouble remembering this, then the author comes to your res rescue with a mnemonic. Here is a line that, if you remember, will give you the layout to ensure that your right 15 people survive. And here it is. It says, Populiam Vergam Matrem Regina Tenebat. It's in Latin. It seems to me slightly odd for a book whose selling point was that it was written in the English tongue. But never mind, how does this work? Well, the vowels are positioned so that A is 1, E is 2, I is 3, O is U, O is 4, and U is 5 in natural order. And the position of vowels gives you the number of men in a sequence to be arranged. So the first word, populeam, gives us 4 from O, U is 5, E is 2, A is 1. After we throw an overboard, but if there happen to be 32 merchants rather than 30, we have no idea how to solve the problem. So this is a, a perhaps a rather um, not as useful as it might seem puzzle. Um, what's the point of this one? I think the point is to show off the rather clever mnemonic that the author or somebody has devised to, so, to remember the solution to a problem, the solution of which you would never ever really want to remember. But anyway, enough of that. Um, I'm going to ask you a question now. I'm going to show you a sentence and I want you to count how often the letter F occurs in the sentence. I'm not going to read it out. I want you to read it for yourselves, to look at it for yourselves and tell me how many Fs are in this sentence. Now, I don't know what answers you've come up with, um, but usually many people say the answer is three. There's F in the words finished, files and scientific. But some of you, and perhaps all of you, will have noticed that this is wrong because Fs also occur in the word of, which occurs three times. And you get many people, and I fell into this trap when I saw this sentence first, miss the letter F in the words of, in the words of. And why is this? But well, presumably what is happening is that although we think we are looking at the sentence, in fact, we're thinking of it phonetically. We are mentally hearing the words rather than seeing them. And when you hear the word of, you don't realize it has an F in it. And this is supported by the fact that um, people who are deaf always get this right and that people for whom English is not first language get it right too. So the point about this puzzle is that it's really only of interest if you get it wrong. It shows you how you think, how you how you how you read, how you see words that you see them phonetically rather than as letter combinations. And that's quite interesting. But um, the point of this puzzle really is that if you get it wrong, it, show, it shows you something about the way you think, which is perhaps slightly surprising. Here's an old riddle which I first came across in a book of the mathematical writer Martin Gardner very many years ago. At the time, I'm quite pleased with myself over this. At the time, I thought it was a silly puzzle because the answer was so obvious. But a father and a son are in a horrible car crash. The father is killed. Son's taken to hospital. The surgeon says, I can't operate. That boy is my son. What's going on? Well, this um, riddle has been given to in, um, by researchers to lots of children, and they come up with some ingenious answers. The father is not the biological father of the boy, but is a priest. The surgeon is a ghost. The boy is the son of a gay couple and has two fathers. What they don't come up with is the answer that the surgeon is the mother of the boy. And 
people find it hard to conceive of a surgeon being a woman, which seems quite depressing in this age. What's particularly depressing is that even children whose mothers are doctors have trouble seeing the solution. Even feminists have trouble seeing the solution. So this is a riddle that shows depth of gender bias that many of us unfortunately still suffer. And it works the other way around too. If the puzzle is that a mother and son are in a car crash, the mother is killed and in hospital, the nurse says the boy is their son. People assume the nurse is female. And so this is a puzzle whose point is not really the solution of the puzzle. It's the bias it reveals in the solver. And a slightly similar one, I think, um, I was at a uh, talk by Professor Dame Celia Hoyles a few years ago when she talked about a puzzle she gives when she visits classes of math, math classes in schools. And her puzzle is something like this. A ship is traveling with a cargo of 24 cows and 17 ducks. How old is the ship's captain? And the children will answer 41. Why 41? Well, clearly you have to manipulate the numbers in the question somehow. 24 plus 17 is 41, which is a good, like the age for a ship's captain. 24 minus 17, 7 would be too small. 24 times 17 would be ridiculous. So it's the only sensible way to combine the numbers. It's wrong, in fact, because the captain of the ship was 35. And how did Celia know that? Well, she asked her because she's a friend of Celia's. And to my shame, that rider completely caught me. It hadn't occurred to me until Celia used the female pronoun that the ship's captain might be female. And so any pride I can take in getting that previous one right when I was younger, I'm afraid this one um, I didn't get at all. So what, what is this one about? I think it's trying to illustrate the what's going on in math classes in schools. The children have been given lots of exercises involving numbers and that they're answering them by rote without thinking what the words mean, that they don't expect the questions to make sense, that they just think they have to combine numbers to get an answer and that it doesn't occur to them to worry about the meaning of the actual question. Thinking about it more recently, I'm not entirely sure that's entirely fair. Um, if, for example, you look at the um, private eye column Dumb Britain, which gives silly answers given by contestants in TV quiz shows, the pattern is that when people are put on the spot and an answer is expected, they don't always hear the full question. They focus on one or two words in the question and give an answer which is suggested by these words, but which may not make sense in the context of the whole question. And actually putting people on the spot and demanding an answer is quite a challenge and people don't necessarily think logically in answering that and I think there's an element of that possibly in the school children's answers. Okay, as another example of a um, useful puzzle, um, I haven't been able because of lockdown to check my memory here, so this memory may not be entirely correct, but in Stephen Jay Gould's excellent book, The Mismeasure of Man, he talks about the use of intelligence tests to test prospective immigrants to the United States early in the 20th century. You're trying to assess whether somebody is mentally defective in the phase of the time, and you can't ask them questions in English because they may not, you may not speak English, so you give them picture questions. So here's a question, what is missing in this picture? And people answering this are put under a fair bit of pressure because you know, if they can't answer, they may not be allowed into the United States. The intended answer is the chimney, which is perhaps more obvious 100 years ago than it is now. But Gould reports that one of the prospective immigrants, an Italian, um, looked at the picture and said, what's missing is the cross above the front door. 
and this shows the importance of context that cultural context can change the answers to puzzles and um, so this test question you know, actually in a sense also shows the dangers of having test puzzles. Right, I want to move now to an example which um, is um, about mathematical ideas, about probability. So this example is about a princess who goes to sleep on Sunday uh, as part of an experiment. Um, the idea is the princess will go to sleep and then a fair, toy, a fair coin is tossed once and depending on whether it comes up heads or tails, the following actions occur. If it comes up heads, then Sleeping Beauty is woken up briefly on Monday once and then sleeps again continuously until Wednesday. If the coin comes up tails, she's woken up once on Monday again, but also once on Tuesday. And then again, she sleeps until Wednesday. When she's woken up, she doesn't know what day it is. Nobody tells her it's Monday or Tuesday. When she sleeps, she loses all memory of the time she's woken, so she doesn't know when she wakes whether she's previously woken up or not. And she knows in advance exactly what's going to happen. So the question is, on the occasions when she's woken up, what does she think? What's her estimate of the probability that the coin that was tossed came up heads? Now, if you've studied probability at university, you've seen problems like this, and this is how you might address it. Um, there are four equally likely outcomes. If you look at the possible events on Monday and Tuesday, um, it might be a Monday, sleeping period is awakened, and the coin came up heads. It might be Monday, the princess wakes, and the coin was tails. It might be Tuesday, the princess wakes and the coin was tails again, or it might be Tuesday and the princess doesn't wake because the coin came up heads. But the princess is only aware of three of these possibilities, and the three listed here, and in one of the three, the coin was heads, in the other two, the coin was tails. So the princess thinks the probability of heads is one in three. And that seems like a sound argument similar to many problems I've seen before. Here's another argument. This time, well, the argument is that before she went to sleep, Sleeping Beauty knew what would happen. She knew that the coin was fair. She knew it was equally likely to land heads or tails. When she wakes up, she has no new information. She always knew she was going to wake up. So she there's nothing that's happened unexpected. She has no reason to change her initial estimate. So she sh should stick with her estimate that the probability of heads is a half. And again, that seems like a valid argument. The only problem is we have two valid arguments giving di different answers. And indeed, um, over the last 20 years, over 100 papers have been published in scientific philosophy journals about this problem. So this is an example of a puzzle that is there to illuminate or possibly obscure thinking in terms of conditional probabilities. Puzzles have been a topic of interest in lockdown. So various people have been setting regular mathematical puzzles during lockdown. In fact, I think I even set a few myself for our faculty for a few weeks. Um, but Notable examples include Peter Winkler's Puzzles for the Quarantined, weekly puzzles for the Muse Museum of Mathematics in New York, um, the Institute of Mathematics and its applications, the um, Maths Communicator Matt Parker. Lots of people have been setting regular math puzzles. And of course, even before lockdown, there were a series like Rob Easterway's Puzzles and New Scientists. And there's a particularly nice one today, I think. And Alex Bellis's column in The Guardian and many others. New to me in lockdown was the Cracking the Cryptic YouTube channel in which Mark Goodliffe and Simon Anthony 
lots of Sudokus, interesting um, variants of Sudoku, um, and they, they publish videos of their solving these problems. Um, they each publish one a day um, and have done so since last March. Um, and um, they report that many viewers say that these puzzles help them cope with lockdown. The Cracking the Cryptic channel now has over a third of a million subscribers on YouTube. And the Miracle Sudoku, which is a particularly wonderful example, which I really encourage you to watch if you have any interest in these things, um, has had over two and a half million views. But if it said to me a year ago that I might spend half an hour, or in some videos, an hour and a half, watching a man mumbling to himself while solving a Sudoku, I'd have been quite surprised. But actually, um, what I get from it is watching is the enthusiasm and excitement. And Simon and Anthony in particular is often moved to tears by the beauty of the puzzles he is solving. But it also shows the, the, the value of the words I used at the beginning, resilience and perseverance, that they make mistakes and they don't give up, they recover, they get stuck. They get stuck possibly for a long time. Um, you know, I've watched a video of a man solving a Sudoku, unable to enter a single digit for almost an hour. And they don't give up. At least they don't give up in the videos we actually see. Presumably, if they were to fail to solve a Sudoku, the video would not appear. But it also gives me confidence. I see that experts miss things like I miss things. They make the same mistakes that I do. I find myself shouting furiously at the screen when Simon is missing something which I've seen that he hasn't. But above all, it's the closest I've ever come to watching a mathematician think, seeing that you know mathematics mathematicians don't think linearly from A to B, they don't find the direct path to the student to the solution every time, they take wrong turnings, they get stuck, and they feel emotional. And watching um, people solving puzzles is is what I think really like watching seeing how mathematicians work. Anyway, I want to give you one of Peter Winkler's mind benders for quarantine. Um, quarantined. So this is one in which two mathematicians are having a conversation on the bus and Ephraim asks Fatima, so Fatima, how are your kids doing? How old are they now anyway? And Fatima answers his question helpfully by saying, as she pockets the change, that it turns out that the sum of their ages is the number of this bus and the product is the number of dollars that happen to be in my purse at the moment. I do miss these lockdown conversations with colleagues. So everyone continues. So if I remembered how many kids you have and if you told me how much money you're carrying, I could deduce their ages. Fatima says, actually, no. And in that case, FM says, I know how much money is in your purse. So the puzzle is, of course, what is the number of the bus? So what can we say about this? I mean, um, on the face of it, we have a conversation in which Ephraim asks Fatima a question. Fatima responds by referring to information he does not have, but which even if he knew the information she's referring to, he would not be able to answer the question he'd asked. And he is able, knowing that, to deduce something not very relevant. Um, his interest in the ch children doesn't really seem to be very serious. He didn't know how many there were, and he is sidetracked by the puzzle. But what, why is this puzzle interesting? And I think mathematicians like it because it shows the use of negative information. The only information we have is that if somebody had some information which they don't have, they still wouldn't be able to answer the question. And from that, we can do, deduce something quite interesting. So that's, um, I think, you know, a rather roundabout, but rather fascinating kind of puzzle. But for the last puzzle, I want to show one of um, Raymond Smolian, the master of all logical puzzles. Um, and this is one, one of my favorite of his puzzles. 
um, I would offer somebody in the audience a chance to win a prize. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to volunteer. I can't see the audience while I'm presenting, so I don't know what's going on. Do we have a volunteer to try to answer a logic puzzle? Or shall I just... Um, I'll, I'll just... Um, go ahead. So, there are two go envelopes. Ahead. OK, yeah. There are two envelopes. One of them contains a prize, the other is empty. There's a statement in each envelope, and these are the statements. Envelope one says, of the sentences in the envelopes, at least one is false. Envelope two says, the prize is in envelope one. So which envelope do you choose to open? Well, the logic might be like this. Consider a statement on envelope one. Suppose that statement is false. Then it is certainly true that at least one of the statements is false, and then therefore the statement in envelope one, which we assumed is false, is actually true. That's a contradiction, so a statement on envelope one can only be true. It cannot be false. So if the statement in envelope one is true, one of the sentences is false. It is not the one in envelope one, because it's true. Therefore, the statement in envelope two must be false. Therefore, the prize is not in envelope one, the prize is in envelope two, and the logical um, player will therefore choose to open envelope two, uh, confidently expecting the prize to be in the envelope, but they were wrong because the prize is in envelope one. How is that possible? So I'll leave you to think about that, but I want to finish by just thinking about different kinds of puzzles. The composer Howard Skempton once told me that there are three kinds of piano music. There's piano music that is written to be listened to. And you might think that's all music, but Howard argued that there's also music that is written to be played, and music that is written to be read, and that these can be distinct kinds of music. And I think that's very wise, but I think that you can say similar things about puzzles. Um, there are puzzles which are written to be solved, created to be solved, where the solution of the solving the problem is the enjoyment, but there are also puzzles where one can enjoy the solution without solving the problem for oneself. A classic example of that, which you can Google, is the hundred prisoners problem. And of course, there are puzzles which do train you for real world problems in various ways. There are puzzles which help you understand your unconscious biases. We've seen, I hope, one of them. We've seen puzzles which test mathematical thinking. The um, Sleeping Beauty puzzle really forces one to think very deeply about one's understanding of probability. And above all, there are puzzles to share beautiful ideas. So um, thank you for listening. What I've argued is that what is the point of this puzzle is quite a complex question, but at least it's given me the opportunity to share some of my favourite puzzles. So thank you very much. Oh. Oh.